Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I'm your host, Chris Smith. I work at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Thanks for being here and joining us for today's very special program. Well, we have very special programs every Wednesday at noon as part of this series. But for the month of February, the Office of Environmental Education, the folks who help organize this lecture series every single week, uh, have booked an extra special slate of guests in order to celebrate Black History Month. So the Committee on Diversity and Inclusion within the Department of Environmental Quality is sponsoring February's Lunchtime Discovery Programs. We've had an incredible series so far. Today, I think, will be no different. And I'll remind everybody that next Wednesday at noon, we'll be finishing out the month with uh, author and professor Drew Lanham. Going to be a great program, so make sure you go ahead and mark your calendars to be with us next Wednesday as well. And check out eenorthcarolina.org, the Office of Environmental Education's website, to see upcoming programs for the month of March. They've already got the programming up for March as well, when we'll be celebrating Women's History Month. So great programs coming up. I hope that you'll be with us and continue to join us for the program every Wednesday at noon. We learn something new, we meet interesting people, and we have a good time doing it. And one of the coolest parts about the program is that everybody out there watching, you have the opportunity to engage and interact with us as well. So the chat box on YouTube, the comments on Facebook are open and available to you. Feel free to leave your questions and comments about the presentation as we go through. And then at the end, I'll be grabbing those cues and then posing them to today's guest speaker so that we can get some answers and hopefully have a great discussion around today's topic. Which means I should go ahead and bring on today's special guest. <laughs> Today we'll be hearing from Lauren Farr. Lauren is a master's candidate at North Carolina State University in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology, studying birds in urban environments. Lauren, welcome to Lunchtime Discovery. Hello. Well, Chris, thanks so much for having me and thanks for that lovely, lovely introduction. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, but before I get started, I'll just uh, talk a little bit more just about what I will be going over uh, this afternoon. So first and foremost, um, wherever you're joining from, welcome and thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon during your lunchtime. Um, if you're in Raleigh, I hope that you're uh, getting outside and enjoying the sun. What is this, like the first or second day that we've seen sun, which is great because it's just been raining off and on um, in this area. So, um, but anyways, uh, like Chris was saying, uh, my name is Lauren Farr. I am a uh, current graduate research assistant at North Carolina State University here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I am a second year master's student pursuing my degree in fisheries, wildlife and conservation biology. And today I will be discussing the topic that um, I know the most about what my uh, thesis is on um, in urban ecology. So analyzing the effects of urban noise and light pollution on avian communities. So um, before I get started, I'll just sort of do a rundown of what I'll, I will be discussing. So um, first and foremost, I'll sort of set the scene with a little depiction um, that I found online that I think sets the scene really, really well for what we will be discussing today. Um, then I'll sort of introduce some uh, definitions that you may hear me use. Um, and then I'll sort of go into urbanization as a whole and how it affects different animals. Um, and then I will narrow it down and discuss birds. I'll move into more about my research and um, what I do uh, in urban ecology. And then um, we'll end with a what I, I will um, I will uh, think is probably going to be a very great uh, Q&A session. So um, get your questions ready. And I hope you learned something new today and I hope you take away uh, something from this presentation. So without further ado, I will jump right into it. So um, like I said, so this depiction here, I think sets the scene really well for what we, would, we will be discussing today. So um, in this picture here, <laughs> we have a witch who was talking to her neighbor and the witch is saying, I remember when this was all forest. So as we could um, infer, the witch has moved out of her nice little forested area into an urban environment. So we see we have a bunch of houses, we have a bunch of birds in the sky, we even have a guy um, in the lower left corner here who is mowing his lawn. 
And um, so basically, this is a, uh, a fact that I pulled from a study that I was uh, looking into. And basically, it's saying that urbanization defined as the population shift from rural to urban areas is projected to increase by more than 3 billion people between the years of 2010 and 2050. So if we think about that, if we stop and think about that for a second, that that's a ton of people. And um, though it may seem like, you know, that's a lot of time, I mean, which I, I guess it is, but that's a lot of people <laughs> in that amount of time that are moving into these urban areas. So um, I like to tell people, I kind of like to set it up as, you know, we have to think about, we sort of moved into um, wildlife's environment. We sort of, you know, moved into their homes. And so they're having to adapt to um, what we call, you know, anthropogenic effects. So basically what we're bringing in um, when we talk about urbanization, um, us as human beings, what we're bringing in as we move into these urban areas. So um, I, I, I stress it a lot that I, that I think it's really important for people to understand the impacts that we're having on wildlife in urban areas. So I will start off here um, with just going over some examples of some animals that we may find in urban areas before I get into birds, because I think, you know, before we sort of dive into the nitty gritty of understanding how urbanization affects birds, we kind of need to understand the whole realm of urbanization and how it affects other species of wildlife. So um, before we get into that though, I do have these two definitions. Um, and these two definitions here, I will most likely try not to use because they're, they're a tongue twister and, and very wordy. So I will stick to probably urban noise and light pollution. But just so you guys are aware of um, these terms, they are mostly used in the urban ecology realm when we are talking about urbanization and uh, anthropogenic or human produced effects. So that brings me to my first term. So anthropogenic, so is an adjective, <laughs> um, which means, um, basically on chiefly of environmental pollution and pollutants um, originating in human activity. So if we think about this, uh, we're basically meaning anything that we as humans produce. So um, when we're talking about anthropogenic noise, this can come from, you know, construction noise, this can come from our cars. I mean, it can even talk, it, it can even come from, you know, us talking, <laughs> like that's our anthropogenic noise. Um, and it's, it's important to kind of uh, disassociate, you know, anthropogenic because there's different different categories under anthropogenic. So, you know, there can be natural noises. So that could be anything from like the wind or waterfall, those kinds of things. Whereas anthropogenic, we're talking about human produced noise. So those um, construction noises, traffic noises, things like that. And then we also have this term artificial light at night or um, a lawn. So this is a light source that is not naturally occurring. So what we mean by this is, you know, um, light, ar basically artificial light at night. So we're talking about, you know, lampposts in cities. So a lot of lampposts, you know, we see in, in cities and in urban areas, they're very bright. Um, uh, artificial light at night can come from illuminated buildings. Um, it can come from illuminated billboards. Anything like that is uh, what we call artificial light at night. And the thing about artificial light at night is that it um, contributes to what we call sky glow. So sky glow is sort of like what it sounds like, this like a this glow in the sky almost um, that is coming from artificial light. So if we think about it, you know, lamp posts that are maybe, you know, posed upwards, anything that's facing upwards to the sky can contribute to sky glow, which we'll get into later in the presentation on how that might could affect birds. But like I said, um, I'll try to stay away from these terms and just use urban noise and light pollution because they're, they're easy to say and they're, they're not a huge tongue twister. But again, I did want to associate you with these two terms. Okay, so now we'll get into our um, animals. So our different species of animals that you may find in urban areas and how urbanization might impact them. So first here we have a white-tailed deer. So when you think of um, deer, so to speak, um, how can urbanization or how might urbanization affect them? So we can sort of maybe think of their habitat. So deer love to bed um, in mature forests. They spend, you know, the majority of their lives in mature forests. 
Um, so we can think about this as, you know, when we're coming in and we're building, you know, our, our, all of our construction buildings, you know, so we're building our schools, we're building our housing developments, things like that. Um, we have to, you know, uh, think about um, what we do with those forests. So clear cutting per se. So you basically have to clear cut the entire forest in order to, you know, build all of these buildings. And so what people don't think about is that when you're doing that, you're destroying, you know, an animal's habitat. So for deer, uh, per se, um, although their populations are great, I mean, their populations aren't decreasing anytime soon, um, we still have to think about, you know, how they might be impacted. And it could be um, from clear cutting, their forest habitat could be impacted. The next we have turtles. So when we think about turtles, we might think of things such as vehicle fatalities. So basically when you're driving down the road and you see a turtle crossing the street, uh, which I hope that, you know, you are in a place where you can help the turtle cross the street, <laughs> um, you know, but, um, but if, if you're not, people have uh, been, you know, thinking about ways that we can help not only turtles, but other species of wildlife who might be trying to cross busy roads or highways that um, sort of, you know, um, sort of go right through their habitat. So habitat fragmentation is what we call it. And so scientists and researchers um, have been developing these sort of like, you know, wildlife passages and things like that, safe, safe passages in order to allow wildlife to cross from, you know, one, uh, from one point to another safely without being hit by, you know, vehicles. <laughs> so vehicle fatalities. So um, this is incorporated, you know, in some states, but not all, but uh, hopefully over time, it'll be, you know, incorporated greatly uh, throughout um, other states and other areas and other cities. So next we have raccoons. So when we think about raccoons, I use the example of supplemental feeding. And I don't necessarily, by that, I don't necessarily mean that we are purposely feeding the raccoons per se. Um, <laughs> at least I hope we're not feeding the raccoons, but because feeding the raccoons would be bad. Um, but um, just, you know, with that, you can think of, you know, urban areas have a lot of trash, you know, they, we could uh, picture that urban areas, you know, with a high human population density, there's probably a lot of trash around, you know, a lot of, a lot of trash in trash cans, people may be leaving their dog food out, etc. So I ask that you keep this in mind that, you know, make sure that your trash is secure, make sure that your dog food is thrown away if you leave it outside or, you know, for whatever reason. But, um, because what can happen is that animals like raccoons can sort of depend, if you will, on that food. If they know that it's there all the time and they have easy access to it, they'll sort of depend on that food. And this is bad, you know, for the reason that um, we're sort of, you know, impairing the raccoon from uh, going to find their own food sources in the wild. And they're sort of depending on us, which that shouldn't be the case. Um, so I ask you to think about that when it comes to raccoons or any other, you know, foraging species who loves to forage in trash cans. Um, but it brings me to a good point, which uh, <laughs> I told Chris that I might go off on tangent. So this is this is one that I have for you. <laughs> um, but it brings me to a good point that a lot of people bring up the fact of feeding birds. Um, a lot of people have the idea that, you know, well, should we be feeding birds? Birds are wildlife, so why are we feeding the birds, but we can't feed other wildlife? Um, well, to my knowledge, there have been no studies which suggest that feeding the birds um, is bad. Uh, birds are still well off to, you know, go and forage, you know, in the winter time or, or whenever they need to go find their own food sources, insects, you name it, they'll still go do that, but um, it's, so it's okay for us to feed the birds. So by all means, you have my permission to <laughs> still continue to feed your songbirds. Um, but last but not least, we have this insect here, which is representing our pesticides. So pesticide use is very high in urban areas. And you can imagine because you have a lot of people, you know, you have a lot of properties who plant a lot of flowers and plants and they want to make sure that their, you know, flowers and plants are looking beautiful and they don't want bugs everywhere, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so with this high pesticide use, we have to think about what it's doing to wildlife who may depend on pesticides uh, for, for their diet, essentially. So um, going back to birds, because of course that's what we're here for, which I promise we'll get to in a second. Um, but going back to birds, there have been studies which you know suggest that uh, due to pesticides, insect populations um, have been lowered. And, and in turn, this affects uh, bird populations because nestlings, they rely on a high um, arthropod or insect or insectivore um, insect diet. So, you know, with that being said, we have to think about our pesticide use and how often we're using pesticides in urban areas because wildlife who depend on um, insects uh, will be impacted if um, insects insect populations continue to be lowered. So again. All of this to say that these are all um, effects that these species can have in urban areas. But keep in mind that these examples that I used, they're not you know, specific or relative to the specific species that I use today. They can be you know, used with, with any kind of species. It can affect any kind of species. And the species that I use, there's plenty more that we could probably see in urban areas. But these are just the, the ones that I felt were kind of common that people might think about um, with these examples. So before we get into birds, I promise um, we're gonna have these two things where I sort of dive into um, differences of anthropogenic noise and artificial light at night and basically how wildlife, again, so wildlife as a whole um, are impacted by them. So first to the left here, we have anthropogenic noise. So wildlife um, can be impacted by this. It can cause them chronic stress and this can also have an impact on their communication. So by chronic, yeah, chronic stress, <laughs> um, we can sort of look at the uh, depiction that I have above it, which I think is a pretty good depiction of what I mean by chronic stress. So you could obviously think that, you know, just like with us, if we're in an area that's very loud, um, you know, it could cause some stress. We could get stressed out <laughs> in a loud area. And this can also happen with wildlife. So um, there have been many studies that suggest that this goes all the way to the ocean. So this goes all the way to, you know, our marine species who are being impacted by our anthropogenic noise that we are creating in urban areas. Um, and then anthropogenic noise can also impact communication. So animals who rely heavily on communication, you know, whether it be, you know, whether it's a behavioral thing, whether it be, you know, in the breeding seasons, anything like that. Um, most often there's studies, you know, about frogs and birds um, when it comes to communication and how they mask out um, anthropogenic noise, so to speak. Um, this can also have an impact on species who rely heavily on communication. So again, something to think about there with anthropogenic noise or urban noise. Um, and then to the right here, we have artificial light at night or ALON as the acronym. And for this, um, it can impact species uh, who migrate. So birds are a great example of this, <laughs> which I'll get into. I actually pulled a study um, that actually looked at this, which we'll get into uh, later on, which is pretty interesting. So um, it can impact migration. So again, going back to that sky glow. Um, for this, I'll use birds, birds as an example. So birds, you know, um, as they migrate, they use the stars in the sky and other constellations, things like that, to orient, orient themselves as they're traveling and migrating um, at night. And then um, artificial light at night can also have an impact on growth and development, which some studies have shown that light can have impact on um, uh, things like, you know, adult survival, um, chick growth, things like that. So um, again, just some ways that artificial light at night can have an impact um, on uh, wildlife, but for those two, I use birds as an example, so that's a sneak peek on what's to come later. Um, but last but not least, there is foraging, and I put foraging in the middle because foraging can be impacted by both anthropogenic noise and artificial light at night. So when we think about anthropogenic noise, we think about species who um, rely on hearing uh, to forage and find their food. So a great example of this, going back to birds, is owls. Owls, you know, rely on their, you know, hearing in order to, you know, find their food. So we can imagine that this can be impacted uh, by anthropogenic noise for sure. Um, An artificial light at night. So this could be, you know, species who maybe um, 
you know, use light to see at night. So it, it could be, so I'm posing it as a great thing, but it can also be going back to insect populations. So um, insects are very attracted to, uh, to the light at night. So as you can imagine, um, again, this might be good for species who rely on insects because there will be an abundance of insects, but um, on the opposite, end of the spectrum, uh, you know, insect populations can decrease <laughs> from artificial light at night. So it's a, it's a, it's a give or take uh, situation here. But again, foraging, another example of how, uh, you know, it, how anthropogenic noise and artificial light at night can impact uh, this in urban areas. So now we'll get into birds. I know you're probably like, okay, Lauren, I came here for the birds. So now <laughs> we'll get into birds. So everything that I talked about before, although I did use some bird examples, birds experience these things too. And I will get into the bulk of that. So first I'll talk about um, uh, urban noise first. So these are just a few examples here. So how, you know, again, how does urban noise affect uh, bird populations? So urban noise can affect their circadian rhythms. It can affect their communication, which we kind of touched on. Um, it can affect their reproduction and it can also cause a, you know, fight or flight response. So the two with the asterisk, circadian rhythms and communication are going to be the two that I'll dive deeply into. And I might pull some studies from here so that we can sort of um, you can sort of picture it, if you will, what, what I'm trying to convey. So first and foremost, we have our circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms are a natural internal process that regulates the sleep-wake cycle. So just like we have a circadian rhythm, <laughs> animals have circadian rhythms too. It's, it's the way we live life. It's, you know, it's, that's, that's basically what it is. How, how our, our lights are run by our, our circadian rhythms. Um, for organisms per se, this serves as an environmental cue for many. So um, circadian rhythms regulate, again, uh, behavioral patterns. They regulate reproduction. For birds, it can regulate migration. So um, you can imagine that if circadian rhythms are uh, interrupted or affected by urban noise, that um, it can be pretty detrimental. It can actually, there's been studies that, you know, have shown that birds have, um, you know, high cortisol levels in response to this. So stress, um, you know, uh, their behavioral patterns might be off. So anything like that, that affects our circadian rhythm, we can imagine that, you know, with birds and bird populations, they are impacted as well um, in response to our urban, our, our lovely, but not so lovely urban noise pollution. <laughs> Um, and then here I have a very cool study that was done in 2015. It's one of my favorites. And I think it sort of uh, is a good, you know, take home at least for urban noise. So this study here looked at bird song, so vocal constraints, um, to see why birds sung at higher frequencies in cities. So this study specifically looked at common blackbirds. And um, if you look at the table down in the bottom left here, uh, and you look at the different frequencies, so the green line represents our forested area and the blue line represents our city area. And as you can see, as the frequency becomes higher, uh, you can see that our birds in the city are actually singing higher than our birds in forested areas. Um, so scientists concluded that, you know, common blackbirds, which is a species that they were studying, um, vocalized with a higher frequency and amplitude than blackbirds in forested areas. So why, why did they do this? Um, well, in turn, in order to basically sing over <laughs> our um, urban noise pollution, um, by singing at higher frequencies, these blackbirds were able to uh, reduce um, acoustic masking by low frequency traffic noise. So basically, what does that mean? Basically, um, these birds called uh, behavioral plasticity, they're able to change their you know, frequency, their song, their pitch, basically elements um, of, their, uh, of their songs in order to sing over high um, urban noise. And this is important for many reasons. Again, birds that maybe you know are singing um, in order to defend their territory. So male cardinals, for example, they love to sing in higher frequencies in order to defend <laughs> their territory, territory from other male cardinals. Um, and also uh, birds that rely on, you know, birdsong and like courtship and breeding patterns, things like that. So um, 
birds that are able to, you know, have this and are able to have this behavioral plasticity, they have a really cool advantage when it comes to urban noise pollution. So with that, we'll move into urban light pollution. Um, so there's a lot of things with light. I actually feel like light, at least for me, um, urban um, light pollution is easier to talk about than noise. Uh, so, um, but some examples here of how um, light pollution can affect bird populations. Um, so circadian rhythms, again, uh, reproduction, migration, foraging, chronic stress, and growth and development are just um, a few uh, sort of examples for us here. So again, with the asterisks, the two that I'll go deeper into are migration and foraging. So first here we have a, another glorious study <laughs> of, of urban light pollution on migration. So the study that I was referring to that I said we would get to later, that was a good example of migration, this is it. So um, this study was done in 2017 um, at the National September 11th Memorial and Museum's tribute uh, Tribute in Light in New York. So basically what these scientists decided to look at was bird behaviors when um, these lights were illuminated. So again, going all back to that sky glow and how light pollution can impact that. So basically they found that when illuminated, uh, birds aggregated in high densities, um, decreased their flight speed, uh, they circled and increased their vocalizations all because this light was impairing, impairing their, impairing their, their, their orientation. They, they, it, the lights were impairing, you know, the stars in the sky, et cetera, other landmarks, you know, in the sky that they use. It, this was all impaired by this bright light that was illuminated. Um, but scientists noticed in order to conclude, you know, their, their hypothesis that this was why this was happening, when the lights went out, these behaviors disappeared. For as you could probably imagine, when the lights went out, the birds could see again. <laughs> so, um, you know, just so all to say that that light pollution has, you know, some pretty, pretty huge impacts um, when it comes to nocturnal birds um, who migrate at night. So, a cool example there that I always use um, when talking about light pollution. But I think that we as scientists sometimes, especially when we're doing our research. We love to research questions and maybe, you know, find the, the negative, I guess, so to speak. So we always like to, you know, find like why something is impacting a certain species or something in a, in a negative way, whereas um, it can impact species in a positive way. So this is an example of a positive way that light pollution can actually be beneficial to some species. So um, species like your owls and nighthawks who uh, hunt and forage at night, um, just like they can you know, use their hearing to, to, to forage at night, they can also um, use light to their advantage. So um, again, owls and nighthawks are some common examples that people use. Um, you know, for species who use light to their advantage at night when foraging. And then another study, which uh, was actually recently done in 2020, um, found that some birds, and these were actually songbirds, which is pretty, pretty cool, um, that some uh, passerines uh, species benefited from low light as well. So in this study specifically, they found that birds with better vision did well uh, with light pollution. Um, which increases, in turn, um, helped increase their hatching success um, and raising their chicks. So, you know, light pollution, again, working for the good here because parents can benefit from the light pollution, which can in turn benefit raising um, healthy chicks and having a high nestling success. So again, just some um, ways that light pollution can be beneficial. And I just, I just always urge people to not think about, you know, how stuff can always be bad. You can also think about how something could be good as well. And just to end on another note, um, so what are some other results of urbanization that can impact uh, basically avian communities and avian populations? So predation is one, and I'm gonna go off on another tangent here. <laughs> So predation is one um, uh, impact of urbanization. And what I mean by predation, um, 
you know, uh, big raptor species who maybe, you know, love to prey on, you know, small passerine birds that are in urban areas. That's one factor. But another factor um, is outdoor cats. Uh, don't get an urban ecologist started on um, the topic of outdoor cats because they will talk your ear off about why outdoor cats are bad. And, and really, they are like, so I, I, I'm not the person to tell people what to do, but I'm the person to tell people what to do if you get my drift. So please keep your cats inside. Um, so, but um, outdoor cats, in fact, are one of the leading causes of, uh, bird, of bird fatalities in urban areas. It's, it's all due you know, to outdoor cats as being one factor. So I, I highly suggest and recommend that if you have neighbors or anyone who you know, has an outdoor cat, maybe try to educate them and just you know, tell them, hey, I think, I think our, bird, our, our bird populations would benefit if you, you know, kept your cat indoors. But anyways, I'll leave that tangent where it is. <laughs> um, but the next one, uh, another result of urbanization is food supply. So this is going back to pesticides, which we've talked about before, but I just wanted to hit on it again. So um, food supply uh, as a result, you know, of pesticides and things like that, um, insect, like insects. So there's a lot of birds, especially nestlings who depend on an insect diet. And again, um, these populations could be lowered due to pesticide use and, you know, many other things, but usually pesticide use. So um, just keep in mind that if you do use pesticides to just keep in mind uh, the insect populations and the wildlife that depend on them, especially our bird communities. And then last but not least, we have species richness, which is basically saying, you know, um, basically what it sounds like. So all of these species, there's, there's plenty of bird species who thrive in urban areas. Um, but, you know, there's some who, you know, uh, Resources in urban areas, you know, may be limited. So therefore the birds who may rely on those resources may be limited as well. So our species richness is decreased um, in these urban areas. So uh, just a few other results of urbanization, but now you're probably wondering, okay, Lauren, well, you've told me all this great stuff. How are you <laughs> involved, um, you know, with this? What is, what is your role in urban ecology? Well, I will educate you on that next. So um, coming to uh, NC State as a master's student, um, so I so I'm an ornithologist. If you if you haven't all, if you haven't already picked up on that, um, so I do everything birds. So coming here to NC State, I wanted to do a project working with birds. Um, and so my advisor at NCSU is Dr. Karen Cooper. She's a well-known citizen scientist. She knows everything there is to know about citizen science. Um, she suggested that we do basically this citizen science project sort of mixed with urban ecology. So what we proposed was this project called Cardinal Capture. And we made this a citizen science project um, that was created to determine the influence of urban noise and light pollution on avian physiology. So at first, if you know anything about cardinals, you're probably thinking, why did you choose cardinals? <laughs> um, well, cardinals are, a, are, are essentially, for one, a bird bander's dream, which I'll get to in a bit. but. Um, Essentially, with bird banding, you're basically um, setting up these large mist nets. I, I, I describe them as looking, looking like volleyball nets, so to speak. Um, you're setting up these nets, and you get to capture these birds and hold them in your hands and just, you know, basically take all these morphological measurements, physiological measurements, things like that, um, and just have this data in order to answer um, research questions. And it's good to learn, you know, about bird populations and, you know, communities, things like that. Um, so, but aside from that, um, still, I say cardinals are, are a bird banders dream because cardinals have a very, um, a very hard bite. Um, so as you can see in the, in the picture of the female cardinal, if you can't tell, they, they have a sharp, basically a sharp point at the end of their beak, which allows them to really get good at the, at the sunflower seeds and, you know, crack open the sunflower. It's amazing how they do it. But anyways, um, so you can imagine that if that bites down on your finger, it's, it's going to hurt quite a bit, which it did. So, <laughs> but nonetheless, <laughs> we chose cardinals because they're a very abundant species. Their populations are great. Um, and in urban areas, especially cardinals are, you know, very, they're, they're a habitat, they're, they're generalist species, so to speak. So they're, they do really well in urban areas and can adapt really well. So we decided to choose cardinals as our focal species. So where does the citizen science come in? So we basically um, set up this project on a platform called SciStarter, 
which is a huge platform for a ton of citizen science projects. I urge you to check it out um, if you want to be involved with citizen science or just kind of learn more about what it is. Um, and we set up this project on SciStarter and we successfully recruited volunteers in the Raleigh, Durham and Chapel Hill area uh, in order to do this study. So next you're probably wondering, well, how did you measure urban noise and urban light pollution? Well, we had um, some collaborators uh, at Parks, Rec and Tourism um, who put together basically these geospatial maps of Wake County. And with those maps, we were able to basically see the different noise levels and light levels of different areas. So with that, we put our recruitment along with that and, and tried to recruit people in these different areas in order to capture these different birds to see basically if there was any patterns to just see if, you know, if adult cardinals in areas with, you know, high noise and high light, if their physiology and health were worse off than cardinals who were in low levels of, you know, noise and light, etc. So we successfully recruited about 54 volunteers. Um, I had four uh, undergraduate research assistants who were wonderful in helping me putting the rest of this project together and working with volunteers, etc. in order to get them scheduled. However, COVID hit. And I tell you, when COVID hit, it just put a damper on things. Um, so I'm sure that at a lot of universities, uh, but I know here at NCSU, a lot of people's research was either, you know, canceled or was paused and you had to get approval in order for it to continue and et cetera, et cetera. But with mine, because it was based in urban areas, because it was going to be based uh, around, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people were going to be helping out. Um, I decided, I ultimately decided to put this project on hold. And when I tell you that that was one of the hardest decisions of my life, it was, it was really one of the hardest decisions of my life because we as scientists, we love our projects. We love our data. Like those are our babies. Like it's it, like it, it's, it, that's what it is. So for you to have worked, you know, for us to have worked on this project and getting it ready and everybody was so excited, it, it just put a huge damper on things, you know, when it ultimately had to be paused, you know, due to unforeseen, <laughs> unforeseen circumstances. So in order to combat, combat that, we um, decided to do this second project. So Neighborhood Nest Watch is another citizen science project um, that, that is uh, out of the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. Um, and this is another citizen science project used to determine the influence of human built environments on bird populations. So essentially the data that they collect um, helps these researchers answer questions from avian health to reproductive, reproductive success. So what they do is that they measure, um, they, they basically take measurements of, of, different, of seven different focal species um, along a rural to urban gradient. So what I mean by a rural to urban gradient is that um, basically areas with low infrastructures, buildings and human populations, so that would be your rural, two areas with high infrastructure and high human populations, so that would be <laughs> your urban. Um, so basically how they did this was that um, they encompassed uh, different areas. So private residencies, communities and schools, et cetera. And they basically carried out, they carried this out in the same way for 20 years. <laughs> they carried this out the same way that I would have done with my Cardinal Capture uh, project. So they used, you know, mist nets to capture these seven different focal species and they took different measurements and everything in order to answer a ton of questions about reproductive success. And they've, they've had a ton of papers on it and everything like that. It's, it's a really cool, it's a really cool project and a really cool, uh, really some really cool studies nonetheless. Um, but I will say, and actually this brings up a good point. So someone actually messaged me this morning asking me like how often, <laughs> another tangent, but asking me how like often I was, you know, in DC and just asking me all this stuff basically about um, neighborhood nest watch. And um, so I will reiterate here, which you'll see in the next slide, um, that I only used their data to help answer um, my research, my ultimate research question. Um, I was, I, I never was able to go down there and, you know, help them collect data or anything like that. They, they essentially let me use their 20 year data set and let me sort of encompass it with my noise and light pollution data from the geospatial maps, which we'll see here next, um, in order to answer my research questions. So would I have loved to have been involved in this, in this whole project for 20 years? Yes, but um, unfortunately I was not. I was, 
I was only able to use their data, which um, helped nonetheless. So um, before I get into that, um, again, so this is one of the papers that came out of the study. Um, so characterizing avian survival along a rural to urban land use gradient. So essentially the data used in this study is the data that I used in my um, initial master's thesis that I turned to. So um, basically here, they found that some species like robins and cardinals seem to benefit from urban environments. So again, robins and cardinals, they're very, they're a very generalist species. So they do well in urban areas and they can easily um, adapt. So therefore they found that their survival tended for the most part, tended to increase in urban areas. Whereas other species like wrens, so we have a Carolina wren and house wren here, um, they showed a slightly negative response, which suggested a need for more research because with all of our studies, of course, there's always a need <laughs> for more research. Um, but essentially with these two species, they're, uh, I, I consider, well, I always refer to these species as cavity nesters. So you could imagine that in urban areas, um, so cavity nesters, I mean, you know, like trees, et cetera, things like that. So you can imagine that in urban areas, um, there's, there's, for the most part, there may not be that many trees in certain areas, but if you know anything about Carolina wrens and house wrens, they will nest anywhere. <laughs> they will nest anywhere, which actually, I, I actually wrote a two-parter article about this um, for Cool Green Science blog, which is part of the Nature Conservancy, but again, another tangent. Um, but essentially, wrens will nest anywhere. So um, again, so then it goes back to, well, what could be, you know, what could be kind of impacting their survival, so to speak. Um, so they are insectivores. So going back to the pesticides. So pesticide use and insect, insect populations, um, maybe due to light, maybe due to pesticides, who knows, but we could probably make the hypothesis that, you know, insect populations in urban areas were very low. So in turn, um, wren survival uh, was very low um, as, as a response. So this was just essentially um, sort of the different ways that this study takes place and kind of what they study, but they, they love to focus on avian survival in the Washington DC area along a rural to urban land use gradient. So now this comes to my project, which is sort of the big, the big finish um, <laughs> of my presentation here. So my project is analyzing the effects of urban noise and light pollution on adult avian survivorship. And these species that you see here are the seven different focal species that Neighborhood Nest Watch focuses on. So we have the Northern Cardinal, American Robin, Gray Cat Bird. We have the Carolina Wren, the House Wren, Song Sparrow, and Carolina Chickadee. Um, so these seven species, you're probably wondering why, why did they focus on these seven species? Well, these seven species are very common in the Washington DC area. So um, in turn, these were the seven that they, that they decided to focus on because again, like our Cardinal study, they're very abundant in DC. So they could get the most data um, from these guys. So basically what I have done is I took the data, the 20 year data set that Neighborhood Nest Watch has, has used and has, and has configured over 20 years. And I basically took the geospatial data from my, um, from my, my previous study. So my, my urban noise and light pollution data of the way, uh, well, not of the Wake Forest area. We actually did geospatial data for the Washington DC area, but the same concept. Um, and we put those two together in order to look at adult survivorship. Um, but unfortunately, since my study is not published yet, it'll be published very soon. I can't disclose any, you know, basically any any sort of specifics on what we found you know with with each species so i can't i can't make any you know conclusions just yet to the public but um it will be out very soon so i i i hope you will look forward to that i know i'm looking forward to it but um i will say this i will say that all in all um my time here at state has actually given me the opportunity to learn more about urbanization <laughs> 
and dabble more into urban ecology because my background in undergrad was animal behavior, but still with birds, but animal behavior. So before, before I came to NCSU, I, I didn't know, I kid you not, I didn't know a thing about urban ecology. Um, I, I, you know, I was like, urban ecology, what in the world is this? But as you can imagine, when you're in Raleigh, it's very urban. So it is, it's, you know, so it, it hits you in the face. Um, so when I came to NCSU, that's when I started learning about urban ecology and, you know, and with this project, I learned about, um, avian survivorship, which is pretty cool. I learned about different, you know, techniques and tools to use. So if you know, um, the program, um, our studio program R, um, a lot of scientists use this, um, you know, there, and then there's a Nova and things like that, but I focused on program R, but, um, that was another challenge <laughs> that I had to get through. So I will say that grad school is mixed with challenges and successes. Um, so program R, which I had no idea about, I didn't know how to use it, anything. Um, I was able to, uh, with this data, I was able to use program R and kind of get familiar with it. And it was a great skill that I picked up on. But not only that, um, learning about urban ecology, so to speak, I get the chance to do presentations like this um, with public audiences and, you know, just sort of talk about urban noise and light pollution, because this is what I've been studying for about two years. So got to use it somewhere, right? <laughs> so, um, so what better way to do that than, you know, to educate uh, the public and, and and be involved in science communication, which is uh, which is great um, all in itself. Because when I get comments from people that say, you know, saying like, I didn't know that, I thought that was interesting, or how can I improve this, or, you know, things like that, I know I've done my job successfully. So with that being said, <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed this presentation. Um, if you don't already, uh, you can definitely follow me on social media. I do a lot of, you know, bird photography. I am not a professional photographer at the slightest, but I will, I do have a professional camera. So I'll try to get some bird photos every now and then and put it up on my social media. So my social media handles are um, there down there in the bottom left corner. And you can also, if you have any questions, feel free to email me and my website is posted as well, which I will be sure to share with um, Chris as well, if he, you know, just to have it, if, if anybody asks. So um, anyways, I hope you got something, something, just one thing. If you took one thing away from this presentation, again, I know I've done my job. So <laughs> with that, um, I hope you guys enjoyed and thank you. Round of applause for Lauren, everybody. <laughs> everybody drop clapping hands emojis into the chat box for Lauren. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's always amazing to to learn about the species that have adapted so well to these environments compared to ones that that aren't, but that for some reason still seem just as common. It, yes. Yes. In my mind. Yes. <laughs> like I think I see Carolina wrens all over the place. All over the place. And and like I said, they they nest everywhere. So you know, people people always, you know, they because they're cavity nesters. So people mm -hmm. will always, you know, will sometimes use that, you know, oh well, maybe it's because of tree abundance in urban areas and things like that. But then it's like like you're saying, it's just so cool how these species are just continuing to adapt. Cause again, if you know anything about wrens. They love to nest anywhere. So I mean, so it's like you're not you're not nesting you're not messing up their their nesting you know anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That that is the truth. I uh, yes. I once spent a summer uh, in a rural state park, and so hundreds of acres of forest, tree cavities, protected area, and uh, the wrens would nest in the bathhouses <laughs> uh, on the like the yeah. water and I'm like there's there's like there's trees yes there's yes. trees but they yes. just find every nothing. I get I I get I get a ton of stories from people you know and I I've, I've experienced it myself and I've seen it they'll nest in flower pots they'll nest on spare tires they'll they'll nest in spare tires they'll nest in mailboxes I mean you name it planters like so <laughs> they're they're very adaptable when it comes to their nesting locations that's for sure <laughs> But then on the flip side, there are so many species that face real challenges. Yes. Yes. Because of noise and light that you mentioned. Yes. Like the, I, I love the example of the, uh, the, the light installation. Yes. Yes. And one of the questions that came in 
uh, about that one in particular yeah uh was could the birds have possibly been eating insects that were attracted to light depending on the species mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well that's a that's a good question so um again that's that's going back to you know uh the benefits of light per se. So birds, especially insectivores, but other bird species, you know, eat insects too, but um, light attract, attracts insects. So, you know, with that, there's a high insect population and birds, you know, are attracted to that. So it's a, it's, it's, it's funny because that scenario, it can go both ways because although light can attract insects, sometimes, you know, insects, light can be detrimental to insect populations, which there have been studies that, you know, have shown that. So, it, it, it can go both ways, which is pretty science, um, <laughs> you know, so, um, but for sure. So that, yes, that, that could be a possibility for sure that, that birds are, um, yeah, attracted, you know, to light due to insects. So, but it's a, again, like I said, it's a, in a good way because they're getting all those insects. <laughs> so. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, well, I'll have to, I'll have to go pull up that study in my take a look at that one because yes, I think that's pretty sure. interesting too. For sure. See, it was it was a it was a very it's it's one of my favorite studies that I always use as an example. So it's a it's a pretty good study, no doubt. All right. So I, I'll remind everybody, drop questions. We've got several minutes remaining here for QA. And I see there's several here too, but I'll get to as many as yeah, we can. Yeah, no problem. I'll try I'll I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. No promises, but I'll try. <laughs> Perfect. Can't ask for more than that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, the first one that came up, uh, do you know of any cases where birds change their singing pattern as a result of noise? Now you did reference the study where they altered the frequency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we know about other ways that species change Ooh, their vocalizations? That's a good question. So the majority of the studies that I have read, they've they've changed, you know, different, different like aspects of their, of their song. So what I, so what I went over, so like frequency, pitch, things like that. Um, I'm not sure on patterns though. I'll be honest. Um, I'm not exactly sure on patterns and I, I would hate to tell you wrong, like hate to tell you wrong and say yes. Um, but I could kind of see that that's a possibility. Uh, but again, I would hate to tell you wrong and say a full out yes, but it, it could be a possibility. <laughs> there was a similar question too that came up uh, about time of day that birds would sing. Mm -hmm. So are, are there birds that because of light pollution are singing at night that wouldn't normally? Yeah, so that's another great question, which I actually, so in putting my thesis together, this is an example that I use. So in um, Europe, per se, there have been studies which suggest that European robins um, sing, uh, use light pollution to their advantage, basically, um, and will sing like in early, early parts of, of the morning. Um, I actually found another study which suggests that American robins, which is one of the species that I uh, focused on with my research, um, they did the same thing and used uh, light pollution to their advantage. So they would sing in the early mornings, basically before all of that traffic noise hits. <laughs> so they could like get their singing out, you know, and do what they need to do before we started with, you know, doing our whole traffic noise thing. Um, and this particular study also found too that um, after sunset, uh, they continued to sing as well. So they, there are some species like that who will use uh, noise or, you know, light pollution to their advantage, yes. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Yes. Judith is asking, do the small solar powered lights you see lining driveways produce enough light to disturb behaviors of animal species or plants? That is a good question. Considering that they're solar lights, I, I'm 100% sure that you're fine. Um, they're at, 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 at least they do, at least they do go off. <laughs> so, um, so with, with, you know, with that, I'm pretty sure solar lights are, are your best bet actually, um, you know, or any kind of automated, you know, light at night um, that will go off when it's not being used. Um, again, going back to that, you know, whole light pollution. Yeah. Like going back to that, there's, we see it at night. There's a ton of, you know, lights that stay on. There's buildings that, stay on at night, all the lights stay on at night and there's 
no one in the buildings. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> um, I'm not sure of like specific, you know, states or anything like that or specific buildings that are doing it but there there are you know like some so some citizen science projects so like globe at night is one um and you know there there are some projects who you know are trying to implement these ideas of turning off these lights <laughs> when not in use and trying to you know do you know best practices with those but as far as your solar lights you're perfectly fine with your solar lights because at least they go off and they're not on all day um so you're perfectly fine with that <laughs> yeah i was I, I was wondering if if judith meant uh like the, the little bitty things yeah. that get staked into the ground right and yeah. they're on all night, but they're, you know, they're like half a watt. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they, they illuminate this much ground around right. them. And right. in my mind, right. I was like, well, I mean, those seem. Yeah. Yeah. I, for the, for, for the most part, I think right. you're, I, I think you're solid with those. <laughs> and then, yeah, if we're talking bigger lights that illuminate, say an entire driveway or an entire yes. yard. Yes. Yeah. If the security lights, for example, yes. they, they turn on when you need them on. When you need them on. Exactly. The that's, the time that's, on. that's the key is like they, you know, turn them on when you need them on, but don't leave them on for long, especially not at light, not at night. So yeah, <laughs> for sure. All right. Next one here. Do you know anything? I see if is there any study about nutrition changes associated with light pollution, like overeating? Ooh, that is a good question. Mm, nutrition changes, like overeating. Um. Well, there have been studies. So again, going back to the insectivores. Um, there have been studies that have suggested that due to lower insect populations, parents may not be able to get specific insects who have very, you know, nutritional benefits um, to their chicks and therefore their chicks during their growth and development, they may not, you know, have all the right nutrition that they need um, due to light pollution affecting insect populations. But overeating is a new one that I have not considered. So that is a good question that I'll have to look into further. <laughs> but, but like I said, though, light, light pollution and insect populations um, go hand in hand with parents trying to feed their chicks. If they can't find the right, you know, insects that offer that nutritional value, then their chicks, you know, growth and development may suffer because of that. So maybe not overeating, but not being able to get enough nutrition. Yeah. <laughs> there it's you disrupting go. The, the ecosystem enough. There you go. There you go. For sure. Okay. All right. Stephen is asking, do cardinals have a small home range? How can you relate the features of captured birds to local light and noise factors? Oh. That's a good hmm. I do guess that's a it, it, do, are cardinals ranging between urban environments and uh, exurban environments. Oh yeah. Cardinals are everywhere. Cardinals the... are everywhere. Um, when I mean, so when I mean capture, so maybe I should have made this clear when I mean capture, this was a capture and release project. So when you, so when you mm -hmm. miss net, you're essentially capturing. So you're miss netting wild birds and then you're doing, you know, whatever you need to do, taking measurements, whatever. And then they are released. So I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is what the question is referring to, but they, these weren't captured birds per se. We just captured them, captured them with mist nets in order to get all that we need and then release them. But their ranges are very, their, their ranges are severely high. Like they're, they're all over the place. They're very abundant. But I mean, I'm glad that that question was asked. I did want to make that clear that these weren't birds that were like captured and kept <laughs> in the lab or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, as I understand Stephen's question, I'm thinking, yeah. and Stephen, correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, but uh, if you catch a, a single cardinal in an mm -hmm. urban environment, mm -hmm. can you relate the, the data that you collect from that one bird to the, the local urban environment, noise and light, or are, would an individual cardinal, say, be spending some time in a city and then some time uh, outside of a city where it would be avoiding the negative impacts of of light and noise oh okay okay so for this so in order to do that we only we tried to get we tried to recruit volunteers and only capture cardinals in urban areas so mm -hmm. any 
but but I okay but I get what you're saying though about so what you're trying to say is that we're how are we like sure if this cardinal spends all of its time in urban areas or if it is that is as that I under, as I understand it yes yes that's what yeah yeah honestly there there I mean that's that's the thing with science there's always holes there's always those, you know, things that we put in our in our in our published papers that say, you know, well, we found this, but you have to consider. So that would be a possible consideration. Um, there, that birds can move. Yeah, that birds can move. <laughs> <laughs> so for us specifically, um, there we just would have assumed and just, you know, but yeah, basically assumed. I mean, I know that sounds bad, but I we would have basically assumed that this bird spends all of its time in urban in an urban area because we caught it in an urban area. But that would be a good like gap or hole to mention that you know, oh well, if we you know we found these results of X, Y, and Z, but you still have to take into consideration, et cetera, et cetera, of this bird maybe inhabiting a rural area, but it just so happened that we caught it in an urban area. So that's a good question, Stephen. Thanks for asking that. <laughs> There's always those holes in science, unfortunately. <laughs> All right. Uh, looking at the clock, I think this will be the last one, but it's, sure. but it's a great question. Because sure. uh, as I understand, and I understand, and this person's asking too, that you are engaged with the Black Birders Week. Yes. <laughs> over, that was last <laughs> last spring in the summer last summer yes last summer so it was it was a week in may it was a week in may um so i so i take no credit and people people get it mixed up all the time because my name does surface with the founders and co-founders of black birders week but i in no way <laughs> take any 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 um you know any sort of you know what's that word I'm looking for? Um, oh, that, that word just escaped me. But basically I was, basically I was just a participant in Black Birders Week. But again, my name, take credit. There we go. The word just came back. I in no way take any credit for Black Birders Week. That was, that was organized and run by separate individuals, but some I know personally, some I know very well, some I, you know, communicate with on social media. Um, great group of individuals. Um, but again, like I said, my name sometimes gets surfaced <laughs> with them. So I try to make it clear that, oh, no, that, that, that wasn't me. I was just a participant. Um, so I was just a participant in Black Birders Week. But um, Black Birders Week was a great week because it really highlighted those, you know, those minorities and, you know, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color in the natural science fields, which was excellent. It was so awesome to, you know, see a whole bunch of people, you know, in this field that is underrepresented, basically. <laughs> so Black Birders Week was a very successful week of itself. It got a lot of, you know, social media engagements. Um, and and I, was, I was super proud of the people who put it together. Um, and there, to my knowledge, there should be one this year sometime in May, I believe, but don't quote me on that, but it should, I believe it still should be in May, but um, so yeah, but it was, it was very fun all in itself still to participate in Black Birders Week. <laughs> uh, and then related to that, what are your thoughts on how to increase diversity in birding and in conservation biology? Yeah, so I always use I always say that, you know, in order to increase diversity, you know, in any field, you kind of have to have diverse individuals. So you have to make, this is like my one, my, my like one big tip is that you have to make, you know, uh, first of all, you have to make areas welcome um, for, you know, any, any, any race, especially black indigenous people of color. Um, in order to increase diversity, you have to make areas welcome, but you also have to make um, sort of opportunities, if you will, or, you know, roles that, you know, diverse people can play a part in and be a part of. Because if you kind of, you know, sometimes if we kind of, you know, think about it, minorities may not get the same opportunity as, you know, other people, because there's not a minority or there's not a diverse individual, you know, that can make those decisions, you know, in there. So there's there's not an individual in there that can, you know, basically look over that or, you know, sort of sort of represent that and not give 
diverse individuals a chance. So creating roles for, for diverse individuals so they can be, you know, overall great mentors and everything like that is, you know, great in that sense. Um, if we're talking about, you know, students per se, um, a good way to do that is, you know, this, this is a great one that always comes up, is when you're doing things like offering maybe internships or, you know, any kind of, any kind of position at any, you know, conservation biology field or anything like that, if you're wanting to do that, um, make sure that they're like accessible because a lot of, uh, as you can imagine, you know, there's a lot of underrepresented minorities who come from different backgrounds who may not be so fortunate. So um, making, you know, paid positions um, when it comes to internships and, and things like that, making, making them accessible, making them paid, <laughs> like, you know, that's a big one. Like, is this paid? Like that's, you know, it's a, it's a huge one. Um, because if you don't have that and you don't have that openness, minorities will sometimes shy away and they'll back up and they'll be like, okay, well, I don't think this space is for me. I don't think that I'm going to fit in here. I don't see anybody who looks like me. So if organizations play a part and basically recruit diverse individuals who can come in and represent, you know, represent under, under, underrepresented minorities, they'll see, you know, that, oh, that's someone that looks like me. I can get to where they're going, you know, I, I, you know, and they'll, they'll probably, you know, they'll, they'll see that it's, it's possible, basically, is what I'm trying to say. So um, in, in summary, just making spaces comfortable and making positions to where diverse individuals can be a part and basically uh, participate in that recruitment of underrepresented minorities and then making making these opportunities accessible for everybody. Everybody, one more time, big round of applause <laughs> for Lauren. Lauren, thanks for being with us for Lunchtime Discovery this week. Yes, this has been fantastic. I, I enjoyed it. I'm sorry I went off on so many tangents, especially that last one, I'm sorry. but. <laughs> They were perfect, gorgeous, <laughs> wonderful, brilliant. Thank you so insightful. much. I, I I appreciate it. I love being here, and I appreciated that that you that you guys hosted me. So I I appreciate it, and I'm I'm looking forward to Drew Lonham, <laughs> Dr. Drew Lonham. He's up next, so everyone stay tuned for that because he's a wonderful colleague. <laughs> so he's he'll be he'll be great, and I'm sure that you will enjoy his talk as well. So. But again, thank you for everyone who came out. I appreciate it. <laughs> Lauren did my job for me, everybody. We'll see you next Wednesday at noon. Uh, to get notifications, you can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel below, ring the bell to get notified. That way, when we do go live with our next set of programming right here on our YouTube channel, you'll get the notification and you can come and join us. Uh, check out naturalsciences.org for a full schedule of virtual events and activities that you and your friends and family can participate in all throughout the week. We've got special events coming up all the time. Uh, tomorrow, for example, we've got several events going on. We're gonna be doing a five hour live stream to mark the Mars 2020 Perseverance land there. Uh, that happens starting at noon, special programming. Tomorrow night, we'll be talking about parrot cognition on the Museum Talk Show Science Tonight. Uh, what else is going on? There's a lot happening. There's a whole lot going on. So naturalsciences.org, at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can sign up for the Lunchtime Discovery listserv to get notifications about this particular program by visiting eenorthcarolina.org. Again, thanks to the folks uh, who sponsored this program from the Committee on in Diversity and Inclusion within the Department of Environmental Quality and the folks in the Office of Environmental Education and the team at the Museum of Natural Sciences who helped us put this on. Everybody have a great week. Stay safe out there. We'll see you again soon. Bye everybody. <laughs>